All right. Let's get started. So thank you guys all so much for coming. Um, how are you guys enjoying Linux Fest so far? Yeah? All right. I got to tell you, uh, Linux Fest is one of my favorite uh, Columbus conventions. I've been coming here since, I mean, before my career even started. And uh, it's just been, it's been a blast. I love the community here. I love the open source focus. And, uh, and I love the people. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So um, I want to thank you guys for coming to this presentation. Uh, one of the things that, to me, is uh, worth calling out right at the outset is that this entire thing is a passion project for me. Now, um, I'm not going to say anything <laughs> bad about you know fo folks who are uh, presenting and here representing uh, companies vocationally. I think that's great. But I hope that as we go through this presentation, you guys can catch some of the enthusiasm and you can kind of feel how important this is to me because uh, because it really is, and I want to I want that to be a little bit contagious. So let's go through and just do a couple of introductions real quick. This is me, um, not necessarily one of my better days, but I'm Alex Markley, and I am a maker. I've always been a maker. I really enjoy building things. I really enjoy constructing software. I do software engineering. I do um, a little bit of tinkering with hardware and some different things, but. Um, but my favorite thing to make is comedy. I really enjoy making people laugh. I really enjoy you know, making people smile and producing and uploading comedy content online. So to that end, uh, myself and my siblings, we founded something called Markley Bros Entertainment. So Markley Bros Entertainment is an independent comedy studio founded in 2006 and based here in Columbus. And like I said, it's a family business. We're just trying to put some smiles on some faces and establish genuine connections with real people out there on, on the internet. And like I said, it's a passion project. If you guys get the sense that it is very polished and that we have a strong presentation, that is not because we have a ton of money behind us, but because we're passionate about what we do. So I don't want there to be any confusion here. We don't have some kind of multi-million dollar you know, company behind us that's founding us or sponsoring us. That's just not how this works. This is all after hours, weekends, effort. So one of the things that Markley Bros Entertainment does is the Your Face Project, which is why I'm here today to talk to you guys, as of course you, you all know. So what, what Your Face is, I call it a stupid performance capture engine for cartoon animation. And uh, most of those words make sense to me, um, but I have, to, I have to kind of explain them. When I say performance capture, what I mean is I'm trying to take an actor's performance and capture it for later use. Cartoon animation is a specific kind of animation, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's not intended to be realistic. It's intended to be cartoony. And it's stupid because there's nothing new about it. This is all old stuff. So. Um, it's kind of like uh, Linus Torvalds naming Git, Git. So that's my, uh, that's my reasoning there. This project is open source and it's Linux first. We'll talk more about that in a little bit, but I just want you to know uh, at Markley Bros Entertainment, we love open source, we love Linux, and we've received so much from the open source community that what we want to do is give back and invite folks to get engaged with us in this project. And to that end, I'm just gonna highlight, this is not a finished product. <laughs> this is a work in progress, and we are looking for people to get involved. Okay, so the outline for today, basically, we're gonna, we're gonna co cover three things. We're gonna start with where we are, because I'm one of those uh, non-linear storytelling buffs. We'll start with where we are now, then we'll go back to where we, how we got there, and then we'll look forward to the future. So, where are we today? I'm gonna to show you just a couple of demo animation clips and we'll talk about them real quick. Oh, hi everybody. I'm Miss Nubble Fungus. I've been told that I am made with software. I don't really know what that means, 
but you can learn all about it at the Ohio Lennox Fest 2019. I've been invited to come, and I would love so much to meet you all. Please find out more information in the video description below. See you there! Okay, so some of you may have already seen this clip. This was actually posted on social media uh, prior to the, uh, prior to the con uh, convention. And one of the things I want to highlight about this is that that entire clip, all of the animation for that clip was captured in one session uh, in real time with my brother Peter performing as Snufflefungus. And there was no additional keyframe animation layered on top of it to perform the final render. So I want, I want to kind of give you that context as we move forward and, and talk about what it is that we're doing. The next clip is actually a clip from our latest Malix Minute episode. And uh, it does feature a combination of performance animation from your face and some additional keyframe animation layered on top. Let's take a look. <coughs> You can't read it. It says sniffing tree, 10 cents. What's this? Only 10 cents? What a great deal. Ah, money well spent. OK, so like I said, that was a clip from our latest Malik's Minute episode. And uh, it's definitely intended to be silly. It's OK. It's, it's, it's definitely very surreal. So that's intentional. So that's, this, that's the state of where the Your Face project is today. Now, how do we get to this whole thing? Uh, because. I think it would be reasonable to ask the question, doesn't this seem a little, a little bit excessive? And if you've seen out uh, by the registration tables, we have our demo set up, we have a booth, and it's just, it's just a lot, right? And writing the software, it was a lot. And all of this, it's just a lot. So let me tell you the story really quickly of why, how, what was the impetus behind this, and how did we get here? So, First off, I have to tell you about the Malik's Minute. The Malik's Minute was the earliest production of Markley Bros Entertainment. Uh, it was an audio show, and it ran for over 200 episodes. Now, it featured our primary characters, Malix, Linus, and Snufflefungus. Linus being uh, a curmudgeonly laptop, uh, <coughs> whose namesake we all know and appreciate, and Snufflefungus being an alien fuzzball who got trapped in Malix's studio when he broke in looking for his lost memories. So we started out with this podcast, and for some reason, we got positive feedback when we engaged with people on it, and when we brought it out, took it out on the road, and with all the voices, the silly characters, the crazy situations, the surreal comedy, it was a positive experience. However, we were, I was never satisfied creatively by this. And there were a couple of reasons why. First, it was an audio only format, although my brother did heroically provide many, many, many illustrations. Um, it, was, it was limited in the visual uh, gags and the visual storytelling that we could do. Um, and as a result of that, Certain members of our target audience were not able to connect with the, uh, with the material the way that I hoped they could. Especially younger kids and, and younger folks really preferred to see animation. So, so when, I, uh, when I was forming the, the show in my head, in general, I had the idea of a cartoony format that was uh, like a Looney Tunes, but with some live action characters in it. So in particular, I don't know if you've seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but, uh, but this, was, this was the sort of thing that was my inspiration. I'm still looking at it. Yeah, thanks. 
you mean to tell me that you could have taken your hand out of that cuff at any time? No, not at any time. Only when it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> So I love that movie, and uh, that visual aesthetic was something that I was really enamored with and captivated by. So it was something that I wanted to be able to duplicate. So if we're trying to formally <coughs> frame the problem that I'm trying to solve, the question is, how do we bring an eclectic mix of surreal cartoon characters to life on the screen, but at a zero budget. Because <laughs> remember the whole thing about this being a passion project? We did not have a ton of money to invest in this. So there's two factors. When we talk about budget and when we talk about money, there's two factors that I like to highlight because um, Often, often people focus on the sticker price. And I, I, will, I will tell you right off the bat, when we first started looking at doing this, we were talking about software being in the tens of thousands of dollars per month to run to do this job. So the sticker price is definitely a problem, but there's free animation software out there, so why not use that? Well, one of the factors of cost that I want to highlight is manpower. Just being able to get stuff produced at scale, it requires the least amount of manual intervention possible. I mean, I would, I would kind of joke about my brother doing animation for us and how you know I was like a slave driver cracking the whip, getting him to animate until he only had bloody stumps left for hands, <laughs> you know? And still wasn't enough. It just wasn't enough. So. Uh, so that's when we talk about an operating budget, we're talking about not only the cost of the buying a software or getting a license, but also the cost of operating it. So <clears throat> I've been working on this problem, like I said, since roughly uh, 2006. And it, we definitely did a number of interesting experiments, uh, and it included um, taking a look at Blender. It included taking a look at some proprietary software. Um, here's an example of something that we did early. Now I'm very happy with how this turned out. However, as you can see, the animation is very expensive. Uh, my brother was hand drawing every frame and we were making it into a sprite that we were able to move around in a 3D animation environment. So we were able to kind of loop the sprite and reduce the amount of work done in hand drawn animation, but it dramatically ballooned the cost of setting up the environment, setting up the scene and doing the camera tracking and all of that. So it was not a scalable solution by any means, even though we were pretty happy with the result. So engaging with Blender a little bit more, I was able to come up with something that roughly matched the style that I was looking for. There's an anecdote I like to point out because I was actually at a Linux Fest uh, programming the uh, SVG tune outline software that I was using. Basically, I, I wrote a custom algorithm to generate those tune lines on top of a rendered image. Um, but, uh, but this was not enough. And one of the particular issues that I ran into was how do I make him look soft? How do I make him look fluffy with a CGI model? I was able to model all those, but basically when it's motionless, it just looks like spikes. So I tried experimenting with some of the uh, physics options that Blender offers and came up with this. <laughs> Unfortunately, we lost a lot of snuffle fungi that day. <laughs> but it's okay because we pushed through it and we started seeing some real results.
I mean, we're talking about years of work to get to that clip. Um, a lot of it just personal development, trying to figure out how to use Blender. I'm sure, has, has anybody in here actually used Blender before? Yeah? So you understand what I'm talking about when I say it can take years of, you know, personal, you know, wrestling and, and trying to figure out how to actually engage with Blender. Um, but I got something out of it that I was happy with. But, but, now that I had figured out how to make the character look the way I wanted him to look, what about facial animation? Because, to be perfectly frank, facial animation is really difficult to get right. And uh, I hadn't even touched it yet. So here's the thing about being able to do this. Again, the operating budget has to be effectively zero. In order to produce content at the rate that I wanted to be able to produce content, I, I could not get bogged down in manual keyframe animation. There was absolutely no way. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm full time in the, uh, in the technology industry. I am uh, a husband and a father of two with another one on the way. And to be perfectly frank, if there is even the smallest amount of friction in the production process, the whole thing is doomed to failure. So thinking about the problem, that's when the gentle voice of inspiration spoke to me. <laughs> and I thought, well, what about performance capture? Performance capture is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty mature technology. It's something that's used a lot in Hollywood. So, so I thought about trying to use existing solutions. I, I don't want to skip over this part because uh, it would be really, it would be really disingenuous to say, oh, well, I wanted performance capture, so I just started working on an open source project. Um, I tried everything I could to get away with not having to start a new software project from scratch. I just want you guys to know that. <laughs> I was under no delusions at the outset that that would be easy or even a remotely good idea. And to be perfectly frank, the way that I have made your face a successful project is by staying completely inside the bounds of technology and ideas that are as boring as possible so that I'm not trying to do something that is likely to fail. And so again, proprietary and expensive solutions exist today. And unfortunately, they are both proprietary and expensive. And um, you know, they, they predate the project. So I'm not, I'm not gonna claim any new ideas here. I'm just not. Um, I should also point out as a side note, that today, the commodity facial performance capture market has absolutely exploded. Again, when I was working on this, it was early 2017, and uh, you could not get freeware or uh, you know, $99 software packages out there that do what I was trying to do. If those existed, there is a good chance that this project would never have gotten off the ground. So I'm just putting out that caveat, because I feel like that that's, you know, I have, to, I have to call that out. Okay, so when I decided it was time to really dive into this, I started out by examining what was out there in the Blender community. Because I knew I wanted to use Blender, I wanted it to be at least free, and hopefully open source, it had to run on Linux. And so I found a couple of demos of people basically jury-rigging something together inside of Blender using basic marker tracking. So uh, there wasn't a lot of information out there, certainly no documentation, but I was able to uh, cobble together some demos that were using this exact same technique. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I wanted to 
come home with him and see all his other puppy. There was a man there. Oh. He had a puppy. Oh. He asked if I wanted to come home with him and see all his other puppy. Oh no. Of course I said yes. Yeah. Snuffle fungus, you know better. Stranger danger is real. You have to be careful. I was careful. And oh boy, did he have so many cute puppy. All right, well, I guess it could have turned out worse. Next he time also I... had a dozen children locked in his basement and he tried to lock me up too. <laughs> so we had a battle. It was scary, but I was. <laughs> you won? I defeated him and freed all the children. They each went home with a puppy. <laughs> So that was a lot of fun. Uh, it actually worked out really well. However, um, as you can see, probably, hopefully, uh, there were a number of significant defects with the animation. And not only did it produce a result that was not of the quality that I was looking for, it didn't have the expressiveness that I was looking for, but also it was so much work because Blender's marker tracking is really hard to do without a ton of manual correction. So it, it probably would have been a better result and taken less time had I just manually animated the stupid thing. So that was the situation that I was in in uh, the middle of 2017. So I decided, all right, well, how hard can it be? I'll just write some software. I mean, basically, this process of tracking these markers that I'm having to do a ton of manual work on, I should be able to automate this. I'm a reasonably competent software engineer. <laughs> if only I knew what I had to go through. Again, probably this whole project would not exist. Just saying. OK, so let's talk about the internals of your face. <clears throat> there are three domains of performance capture data that we are using today in production with your face. The first one is facial performance capture. And I will talk about these. I'm just going to list them, and then we'll dive in. So facial performance capture is the first one. The second one is audible speech, information about audible speech. And then the third domain is uh, event data controlled by a puppeteer, uh, specifically using a game controller, just an off-the-shelf game controller. So with regards to facial performance data, uh, it took well over a year to get something that actually worked. And I think actually last year when I was here presenting this, we were still using <clears throat> markers. We are no longer using markers. And the way that it works is based on machine learning models that are available off the shelf in open source software. Now, I experimented with a number of them, a number of different ones. Um, in this example, I'm using Har Cascades from OpenCV, however, uh, currently, I'm using GPU accelerated deep neural networks provided by the DLib library. There's a stack of them. Um, they are different levels of specializers that filter down into the, into the frame and get me the information that I want. Uh, I'm actually able to run this process on competent hardware at about 60 frames a second. With very powerful hardware, I've seen it run at 90 frames a second. The whole process was governed by an absurd amount of math. And you have to understand, I really did not do well in school. <laughs> when it came to college and the math in school, I just did not enjoy it. And I really, that's, that's, that's not strong enough. I despised it. <laughs> and so when it came to being able to take this data and accomplish something reasonable with it, it was an uphill battle, to say the least. Um, I actually have a funny story about a time when I was trying to calculate a ray plane intersection 
to try to identify the three-dimensional position, to resolve the three-dimensional position of a facial landmark in, uh, in 3D space. It's a funny story. I was sitting in Panera working and it was getting later and later and I was getting more and more frustrated and then they closed and I hadn't fixed the problem yet and tears started, oh wait, this isn't a funny story at all. <laughs> this is a horrible story. All right, let's move on. Anyway, so we got it to work. The second domain of data that we're using is audible speech. And the thing is, one of the, one of the issues that I detected immediately in the marker-based solution um, was that you could not put enough markers on the lips to get reasonable mouth shapes. And the reason is simple. A lot of articulation in human speech goes on behind the lips. That's all there is to it. And in fact, traditional cartoonists, which is that, that's the style of animation that I was trying to pursue, they don't even look at uh, a video. They listen to the audio when they're doing the animation. It's called scrubbing. And when they do a frame by frame breakdown of the spoken words, then they can uh, map them to animated mouth shapes. There will be a certain subset of mouth shapes that map to phonemes, and those phonemes map back to the frame by frame analysis of what is being said. So my question was, can I do the same process? Oh, and by the way, there is open source software out there to help do the cartoon, traditional cartoon scrubbing. It's all manual, and the user interface isn't that great, and I just didn't want to do it. I thought there's got to be a way to animate this. So if you look online, there are open source speech recognition tools, libraries that you can use. They use commodity models, commodity machine learning trained models. And one of my very first tests in early 2017 was to see if I could just cobble together a Python script to take spoken audio, pipe it through Sphinx, generate phonemes, and then generate from there, generate mouth shapes. And this is what it looked like. Oh, um, you, oh, you need a signature? Um, I mean, Malix is really not helping right now. And I mean, I can't sign anything. Can, can I send you an email? No, I really need that package. I ordered it. Yes, yes, I'm Linus. No, I can't show you an ID. Just, can you just leave it there? Can you just mark it as like nobody was home, please? But no, 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 come back. <sighs> Man, there's just nothing funny speaking to you. So I was very impressed. Uh, now, I, I'm not gonna say that it's perfect, but again, the goal here is not perfection. The goal here is cartoon, reasonable levels of expressiveness at high volume and low cost, right? And that was better than anything I'd seen before. And that was with one evening of Python scripting. So, uh, I, so that technique is the same technique that we use with refinements. That is the same technique that we use today in your face. Okay, so gamepad data. <clears throat> so one of my misconceptions early on in the process was that because my principal characters were a floating laptop head and a hopping fuzzy ball, that I would only need facial and head animation. This has turned out to not be the case. And so I, we've been progressively eating away at the animation task to try to get rid of as much uh, manual post-processing as possible. And I looked into the idea of doing, uh, you know, like digital puppetry. Um, now again, this is not a new idea. I'm gonna illustrate for you how old of an idea this is. <clears throat> 1968. Hello, folks. 
I'm Mr. Computer Image for ABC. I'm generated by a computer, and I think it's only proper that I announce the computer results on election night. My mouth is made to move by my voice. The rest of me moves because some guy in a harness moves. He's my anthropometric programmer. Whatever he does, I do. That's Mr. Computer Image by uh, Lee Harrison III. He uh, designed a system that he called Animac. And that's from 1968. It's the earliest example of some kind of digital puppetry in action. So then the question was, can we feed in this third source of data into our real-time animation pipeline? And here are some results. You can see my brother's using a controller there. It's not the best video, but... So, as you can see, and you'll be able to see it in the demo, we're doing two more demos still today in the, uh, in our, at our booth, but basically it gives, uh, it gives the performer a full range of gross motor control over the puppet. So now we're feeding in all three. We've, got, we've successfully implemented and put into production all three of our aspired domains of data that we have planned. Okay, so we've talked about where we are, we've talked about how we got there, and a little bit of some internals, because that's always fun. Now the question is, what is the roadmap? Where are we going? What is the vision for the product project? Because, I mean, hey, this is cool, and I love coming out and chatting about cool stuff with anybody. I'll do that all day. But there's a specific call to action here because, frankly, I want you guys to get involved. So let's talk about what's next for the project. First, we have a roadmap for major features. And uh, I know a lot of us are completely comfortable on the, on the command line. Maybe there's some of, some of those folks out there who never use a desktop environment at all. I'm not one of those folks, and neither are the vast majority of animators. So if we want the project to be accessible to a larger range of people, then we gotta get past the command line only design. Now we do have a heads up display. The software does come with a heads up display. And again, please come see our demo and we'll show it to you. But currently, the vast array of tunable parameters and configuration options are either hidden behind a command line switch we're buried all the way inside of a configuration file. It would be really great if we had a GUI that folks could use to launch the, uh, to launch the program, or better yet, fully integrated <coughs> with the program. The second thing is, our off-the-shelf machine learning models for facial recognition, speech recognition, and the like are great, but they are flawed. There are challenges that we have specifically around the types of faces that we like to make, like this. The bottom line is, if your training data set came from Flickr or Facebook, there's not a lot of people who post selfies that look like this. <laughs> and so what we've observed is that the software gets a little confused. I would like to correct this, but we will need a massive community to source data pools from. In addition, I think it would be good to train a new network from scratch to detect and track the, uh, the angle of eyeballs, because I think that would be a useful piece of information that we don't currently have. So there's a group, a whole cluster of features that I'd like to be able to add. Next, we need to show some love to Blender. Uh, currently, we do have a Blender plugin. It is open source, it is available on GitHub, and it has some problems. 
Blender just recently changed their entire API. <laughs> so, uh, so we need to, we need to uh, deal with that problem to uh, take advantage of some of the newer features in Blender 2.80. In addition, the Blender plugin can currently only manage one character and one live stream at a time. Now that's fine for studio animation because I can basically set it up to drive a character and then set it up to drive the next character and then set it up to drive the next character. But if we want to do Twitch streaming and do live shows and live Q&As, we need to be able to manage having more than one live animation pipeline running at the same time. So that's on the roadmap for that. And then finally, introducing a uh, CI CD pipeline that does real packaging and pushes the packages out for download. We have that for your face. We do not have that for the plugin currently. In addition, we need help with documentation. There is a lot about this tool. And just getting some kind of user documentation aside from what shows up with dash dash help would be good. In addition, we have a lot of internal APIs that frankly uh, are a mystery to everyone, including me. So documenting that would be good. And then finally, producing some demo content. Because right now, uh, you know, I love you guys. I'm not going to give away my character meshes. <laughs> so we're going to have to model some example characters that we can share and open source that include all of the documentation on how to rig them up and actually use them. So that's, a, that's an aspiration of mine. Uh, testing and Q&A. I think that introducing into the pipeline uh, linting and code style checks, static analysis, and unit and integration testing would be good. Currently, we don't do any of that. And, uh, and frankly, it's bit me a couple of times because I've introduced bugs that I, should, I really should have caught, or even regressions, I should say, that uh, should never have um, resurfaced. Operating system support. Like I said, we are Linux first, and the, uh, the, the program runs best under Linux. That's where I develop it, that's where I design all the interfaces, and that's where we do use it in production. However, currently, we're doing, uh, we're doing an app image build and distributing it that way. It's working fine, but I think we would, it would streamline adoption if it was available in major repositories. I think that would be great. And I, I think we can get there. We just need some folks to help work on it. Other operating systems don't fare so well. Uh, I spent kind of a ridiculous amount of time getting the code to work on Windows. Uh, even though I was using all cross-platform libraries, it turns out the Microsoft compiler is not as good as certain open source compilers. So it took a lot of work to get it to run on Windows. And then, to my dismay, it runs at about a fourth of the speed. No idea why. So figuring that out would be good. Again, just because we're thinking about the artists who might be interested in participating in using this project and making it better. Uh, in a similar vein, being able to build for Windows automatically. I have it a, a lot of it scripted, but I haven't been able to kick it off automatically. I just, it just needs some more love. I, it, we're just not there yet. And maybe eventually support for Mac OS. Uh, I'll be honest, I am a really grumpy at Apple right now because they're having some kind of spat with NVIDIA and I cannot run any of my CUDA GPU accelerated models on Mac OS, no matter what hardware I have. So. Uh, I may just completely abandon macOS, but uh, again, when we're thinking about users, it might be a required target. Okay, so with that all in mind, all of the stuff that we want to do and the vision for the future of the project, will you join me? Will you join me? Let's work on this.
if you're interested in animation, frankly, this is, this is a cool thing to work on. I think if you, uh, if you just pull the code and start working on even just uh, one unit test, I mean, that would be like, you know, uh, infinity and or nan percent more unit tests than we have today. So just helping, helping out with that would be great. <clears throat> Next off, following Mark Libro's entertainment. Join our, uh, join our cause. You know, we, we're, we're call, we call our followers embers. Get it? M-B-E-R. And the way I like to say it is a vote, a vote for Snufflefungus is a vote for open source animation software. If, if you help us out by subscribing to us, then the support of Mark Libro's Entertainment, since Mark Libro's Entertainment depends on and uh, drives the development of your face, Supporting Mark Lee Bros Entertainment supports this project. And definitely help us out. Come check out our booth. We have two more demos, demo times today. Today at 2.30, which is just a little bit after this session. Uh, again at 5, which is just before the keynote. We'll run right up to the keynote. And then we have a raffle that we would love for you guys to enter. Again, tickets are free, come and talk to us. You can enter the raffle and the drawing will be at seven, which is just after the keynote is done. That's it. Guys, thank you so much. <laughs>